Hi everyone, my name is Abraham Sebek and welcome to SAT2 Biology. Okay, so last time we went over the introduction to biology, we went over all the major points like evolution and taxonomy, we went over the genetic material. Well today let's do lecture two and talk about the chemistry of life. See, chemistry is really the study, right? The chemistry of life, this is the study of matter, right? This is all about uh, solid, liquids, and gases, right? Matter, and one more thing, energy. And those two things are needed in life as well. Life is made up of atoms, right? Life requires energy. And so the energy we're really gonna focus on is light energy and ATP. That seems to be the big ones that we keep coming across. But heat energy will also be another thing. So looking at this, the elements of life, the way I always remember this was chin, nops, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, phosphorus, and sulfur. By far, this makes up for about 87, no, 87, 88% of all the atoms and molecules that we use. The most abundant, of course, is oxygen. That's only because it's found in water. So elements of life find so much, we're made up of so much water. And every water molecule has another oxygen atom. And this is by mass, right? Oxygen weighs a lot more than hydrogen. And so 65% of it is oxygen. Carbon, on the other hand, is like the backbone to almost every living thing. I want to just go over like some of the really important things about carbon. We're going to do that in lecture three. But for right now, let's take a look at the chemistry of life, atomic bonding and molecular bonding, because they come up all the time. All right, so now that we know which elements come up, and we also know that atoms come together to form molecules, right? Let's take a look at atoms right now. So atoms are subatomic particles, right? They have they have subatomic particles. Remember, the protons have a positive charge. The neutrons have a no charge. The electrons have a minus charge. Small diagram over here of how an atom looks. So this purple thing right here is the nucleus. And this is where I'm going to find my protons and my neutrons, right? All in the nucleus of the atom. The electrons are going to orbit around the nucleus. They're negatively charged, and they're going to be hanging around on the outside. First shell gets two electrons. The next shell gets eight, and so forth. Okay, ions are charged atoms. They come into two forms. They can either be positive, and if they're positive, we call them cations in chemistry, right? And if they're minus, we call them anions. Sodium, H, uh, sodium, H plus, all these are gonna be very important cations that we're gonna see in terms of the anions also. Um, Chlorine minus, right? Oxygen minus two. So now isotopes are, are the other I word that you should know. So you should know ions and you should know isotopes. Isotopes are gonna be used in um, like carbon dating, for example. The best example of this and the one that comes up the most right here. So I'm just gonna put, that's carbon and I'm, I'm putting it here three times on purpose. Then I'm just gonna put the number uh, of their mass, okay? So I have carbon 12, carbon 13, and carbon 14. And this is gonna be just the mass. So the mass is different because they have a different number of neutrons. You see, the number of protons in your nucleus better be six. If it's not six, you're not a carbon atom. You have to have six protons in your nucleus. Now, what's so special about all these? Well, they come up at different um, amounts. So for example, carbon-12 is about 98% of all the carbon that we're going to see. Okay, while carbon-13 is like less than half a percent. All right, and carbon-14 is roughly 1.5%. So this is pretty big in terms of how much um, carbon that we have, right, and most of it being this. This right here, this is the radioactive version of it, okay? So carbon-14, what happens is it spontaneously uh, decays, right? And it actually turns into a more stable, very unstable. And so it turns into a more stable molecule, uh, atom, such as nitrogen-14. Okay, this happens every 5,730 years. Okay, 507 years. All right, I hope you can read that, but I, I just keep in mind that's, that says 5,730 years. Okay, and that's it. Ions, isotopes, atoms, basic stuff. You gotta know basic chemistry, okay? This stuff is actually taught in middle school in a lot of places, okay? So this shouldn't be that difficult for you. Let's make this a little bit harder now. I wanna talk to you about a concept called electronegativity. So in chemistry, atoms have 
a different electronegativity. In other words, they have this attraction to electrons from a neighboring atom. And so what we're seeing here is this is oxygen, okay? Oxygen's hanging around and he's like, hey, hydrogen, come over here. Let me see you. And then he pulls his electrons in, all right? This is where you, the, the oxygen atom has a, a more of an attraction for the electrons than the hydrogen atom, giving this oxygen a slight negative charge because he stole the extra electron. Not stole it, but brought it over closer to him, right? It's like two children playing. The toys hang out with this guy more than it hangs out with this guy, all right? So let's take a look. Electronegativity and why I brought it up. So here we have ionic bonding. This is the strongest of all bonds, okay? This is by far the strongest. People tell me, oh, I don't think so. Ionic bonds form salts. Yeah, they do. And they said, well, how come salt dissolves so easily in water? If it's so, what? If it's so strong, why does the sodium and the chlorine come apart so easily? All right, that has something totally different to do with water and the polarity of water and why it's so good at dissolving things. Dissolving isn't the same as melting. If you have, now this is a purple salt. This is called copper sulfate, uh, actually a blue salt. It's one of my favorite salts. Now copper sulfate, let's say for instance, you try to melt it. If you tried to melt it, that would take an enormous amount of energy and those bonds would be very, very hard to break. All right, so ionic bonds have an electronegativity difference of anything greater than 2.1. And so for instance, chlorine is pretty electronegative. Chlorine has an electronegativity of 3.0, okay? So electronegativity can go from 0 0.0 to 4.0. Fluorine is the most electronegative out of all the elements, all right? Chlorine has a 3.0, while sodium has a 0 0.8. Okay, if you subtract the two, X in this case is going to be what? It's going to be 2.2, which is greater than 2.1. Therefore, this bond is ionic. All right, now you won't be given the electronegativities. I just want to explain to you that really the electron difference between them. Ionic bonding is all about transferring electrons. And so that's what just happened here. And that's why there's a sodium positive and a chlorine minus, right? His electronegativity is so much higher than sodium's you just have to give, give up the electron, okay? I'm just going to steal it. But sometimes they don't steal it. Elements uh, don't work like that, right? Sometimes there's sharing. But when there's transferring, there's always an ionic bond. Okay, take a look at this one now. Polar covalent. So covalent bonds share. Ionic bonds transfer. Polar covalent we have over here, right? If it's polar covalent, the electronegativity difference is between 0.5 and 2.0. And so this is an example of a molecule of boron trifluoride, where there's a really a positive center and the, the outsides are minuses. That's because fluorine is so electronegative, this is like a 4.0, right? And boron is somewhere like 2.0, um, what, I think it's, it's 1.8, something like that. I might be totally off, but that's okay. This gives you just between 0.5 and 2.0. Another example would be water. So I'm just going to put water over here. So here's a, a water molecule that has a bent structure with its lone pairs over here. Um, oxygen has a 3.5 electronegativity and hydrogen has a 2.2. You subtract those two together and X is 1.3, which falls right into it. And so I want you guys to keep that in mind, that polar covalent bonds is sharing, but the electrons are shared unequally, okay? Always there's one, so as you can see over here, the fluorines have taken their electrons, they've pulled them in closer to them, while the boron is, there's a big shift, okay? And it has a positive. All right, let's get this out of here. All right, so unequal sharing versus equal sharing, right? So nonpolar molecules actually share everything pretty equally. Anything that's diatomic would be a great um, example. So hydrogen gas, nitrogen gas, oxygen gas, right? All of these gases are definitely going to have an electronegativity difference of what? Of zero. Okay, now taking something else like iodine, I2, or chlorine gas, all of these are great examples, all right? Then nonpolar. Nonpolar things do not dissolve well in water. They're sometimes called hydrophobic, okay? Um, another thing to remember about them is uh, 
they're, they're, they're weaker, okay? These bonds are weaker than the ionic and the polar covalent. Right, and that's pretty good. Right, we're going to see hydrocarbons are going to be very nonpolar, right? The phospholipids that make up the membrane have nonpolar tails. And we want to remember that word nonpolar because it comes up. All right, now molecular bonding. So this is between molecules, and we already went over the atomic bonding. Molecular bonding. So I have some water molecules here. And the one I want to go over right here is the hydrogen bonding. Hydrogen bonding is so, so important. Because that's how water sticks together, right? And so what happens is we said before that water, right, hydrogen has a slight positive charge and oxygen has a slight minus. So I'm just going to put a positive here and a minus there. And everywhere there's a hydrogen, it's a positive. And so what happens is they want to just, oh, be very close to this very minus oxygen. Okay, same thing would happen over here. There'd be a plus charge, and if this was ice, maybe they'd want to charge there. Oh, there's another one going to the oxygen and so forth. Right, the water molecules stick together like magnets because they're polarized. The oxygen half has a minus charge. The hydrogen half has a positive charge. Okay, where do we see this hydrogen bonding? I wrote a few examples, but it's found in DNA. It's found in enzyme substrate binding ice crystals, it's found in water. It's not found in water vapor though. Steam is gonna have no hydrogen bonds. So hydrogen bonds break after 100 degrees Celsius. Anything, any temperature higher than 100 degrees Celsius. So I want you to imagine these hydrogen bonds just breaking. It doesn't matter the polarity of water because they're all gonna be individual gas molecules and that's why they spread out so much. All right, this looks great. And we're also going to see it in protein folding in the secondary and in the tertiary structure. All right, now that we have this out, let's take a look, okay, at water's properties. Okay, so water has some pretty unique properties. Cohesion is one of them. Cohesion is simply when water molecules stick to water molecules. So can you see how the water is dripping over here? All right, and how it sticks to each other? Why doesn't it just come out as separate drops? Instead, it's like so sticky, yet they want to be together. That's pretty strong. Cohesion is responsible for the hydrogen bonding, right? This and hydrogen bonding, same thing. Adhesion, on the other hand, is when water sticks to a surface. So what I tried to show you here is when water beads on top of a car, right? You see how it's sticking to the surface or when it's sticking to this leaf over here as dew, right? The water is really sticking to this other surface. So it sticks to each other, it sticks to surfaces. That's so important. If I took a glass of water right now and I threw it on the board, you would see how it would stick to the board and come back down. Okay, this looks great. Capillary action is another thing. Water has the ability to climb upwards, okay? So if water is climbing upwards, how does it get up this huge, huge tree? All right, well, it has tissue called xylem, but the xylem is perfectly uh, uh, designed so that cohesion and adhesion can happen very easily. And so when we add cohesion and adhesion, water climbs upward. A similar thing, this is a hard picture to see, but this was paper chromatography, all right? You might have heard of this before. In BioLab, you might have taken spinach pigments and looked at uh, the different types of chlorophyll. Okay, this is paper chromatography. Chrome means color. Okay, graph means picture. So this is like a color picture, more or less, of the pigments. And the only way that works is that the solvent climbs upwards. Okay, and it has like water mixed in, of course, it's a dilute solvent. And so that property allows water to climb up even a piece of paper, if it, even if it is just paper chromatography. All right, and then another thing is surface tension. So I tried to show you some animals here. Basically, if you were to jump off a bridge, right, and you were to land into the water, it would be like hitting concrete. You'd shatter your spinal cord, you'd get all messed up. That's because water is like hitting a surface, like go in the pool next time or the bathtub and just splash the water, go like this, splash. When you do that, it's gonna hurt. Or if you do a belly flop, that's when you like land on, on your belly only, it's gonna hurt. That's because water just has this surface. And in the winter time, that surface will turn into ice. But underneath all the water, will still be liquid, right? The surface is really what I'm focusing on. That surface, if you're light enough and you're designed well enough, you could just walk right on it like the spider is. Or this guy, he's called the water strider because he can walk right on the water. This is even more special, right? This is called the Jesus Christ lizard. And he can run right across because he's got big floppy feet, all right? But that, he's a, he takes advantage of water's surface tension, okay? Very nice. All right, now evaporative cooling is the next. 
Water, the great thing about water is that once it does reach 100 degrees Celsius, it evaporates. And when water evaporates, it takes the heat with it. So that's why this dog is panting. He can't sweat, but he's trying to evaporate water off of his tongue. What that's going to do is remove the heat from his body. So all the heat, if I had like infrared glasses, this would be like a very red color. And he would be all heat. All that heat would be leaving. Okay, for us, it would be through our head because we sweat. And so there you would see a lot of heat leaving through the head. Here's an elephant. He's just splashing water on himself through his trunk. Same thing. He's got a lot of wrinkles. He's trying to get all that water to evaporate in the hot sun and cool him down, right? Because it takes the heat with it. Evaporative cooling. Another thing is that water has a high specific heat capacity. All right, so maybe you remember this formula. Q is equal to MC delta T, where Q represented heat, right? And then where M represented the mass. This is the specific heat. Okay, so the C would be the specific heat. And over here would be our temperature. The specific heat for water is 4.18 joules for every gram times degrees Celsius. That's basically saying, all right, it takes a lot of energy to make water raise one degree Celsius, right? It takes 4.18 joules to get that water, one gram of water to raise one degree Celsius. Or 4.18 joules, or you could say one calorie. One calorie is also equal, it's going to get water to raise one gram of water to one degree Celsius. What I'm showing in this picture is a picture of the West Coast, right? This is California. And I want you to note how it's cooler by the water. Okay, that's because if you ever notice in the daytime, on a hot day, the water is ice cold at the beach. But the sand is hot. That's because sand has a very low specific heat capacity, meaning it heats up quickly and it cools off quickly. Heats up quickly, cools off. Uh, on the other hand, water doesn't do that. If I boiled water and then I put the boiling water, how many minutes would it take that boiling water to cool down into room temperature? 10 minutes? 20 minutes? 30 minutes? A lot more than it would take the sand or even the atmosphere, the gases in the air. So water, it's high specific heat capacity is very important, making it very cool during the daytime. And actually, it's, it's a little warmer at night. The water is warm at night while the sand is cold. That's because the sand cooled off quickly. The water takes a long time to cool off. It takes a long time to heat up. And keep that in mind. That's really what we're saying with high specific heat capacity. Right, it requires a lot of energy to get it to cool, uh, to heat up, and it takes a lot of time to get it to cool down. All right, solvent for life. Water is so great because it dissolves a lot of different things. A lot of the solutions in our body, right? They're solutions. They have ions swimming around in them. And why do ions work out so well in water? Is because water is polar. And as you can see, the oxygen uh, molecule is negative. So the oxygen molecule just wants to stick to the sodium. And it's like, like the paparazzi covering it, right? All these groupies coming around it. Chlorine's like, oh, I'm trapped in groupies too, except the hydrogens are facing me. The positive ends are facing me, and that's what's sticking to me. All right, and so similarly, this would happen in our tears and in our sweat. It would happen in the ocean, right? Sodium and chlorine, salt, would, uh, would separate or would ionize, solvent for life. Okay, lastly is pH. We have to understand, this comes up all the time, your understanding of pH. This just means the potential of hydrogen. Right? Or some teachers have said the power of hydrogen, it's the potential of hydrogen. All right, now that we understand, what's this whole thing about hydrogen, right? Hydrogen now, the, if it's down here, it's very acidic. So I'm just gonna put acid, and over here we can put base. High pH, you're a base. Low pH, you're an acid. I put some uh, examples up here, like battery acid being the most acidic. But also hydrochloric acid should be put here. So uh, this is what's found in our stomach, hydrochloric acid. Makes up the gastric juice. Right? Then we also put um, what orange juice. If you look more towards neutral, would be egg yolks. I could put rainwater. Rainwater or acid precipitation would come where somewhere around here. Oh, it says over here. Oh, that's good. It says uh, pure rain, right, will come around 5.5 because it has some acidity to it. Swimming pool water, ammonia, and so forth. So this is just a nice little chart for you to look at, okay, and, uh, and just get, get a familiarity of what's going on with pH. 
Okay, one more thing. You should understand, um, they sometimes ask this on the more harder uh, years. I've seen them do this, where they'll give us the pH, right? And then they'll ask you about the hydrogen ion concentration. So if you are very acidic, you have a lot of hydrogen ions. And if you're very basic, you have a lot of hydroxide ion concentration, right? And sometimes instead of H+, they put H3O. Don't worry, same thing, okay? These are the same thing. Consider them the same. So now, what we notice is that at a neutral pH, this would be water, that the hydrogen ion concentration is equal to the hydroxide ion concentration. Now this says, 1 times 10 raised to the negative 7th power, this is 1 times 10 raised to the negative 7th power. And so just keep that in mind. Also keep in mind that at something like, at a pH of a 1 and a pH of 5, what would be the difference in pH? That would be a 10,000 times difference in hydrogen ion concentration. That's really what you're looking at, right? That would be a 10,000 times difference. Okay, and so with that said, guys, uh, we will... Uh, We'll pick this up next time, okay? Just keep on studying. All right, this is your chemistry. All right, um, next time we're gonna take a look at carbon and its properties and some of the organic molecules of life. But until next time, I'll see you later. Be safe.